Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, I'm reviewing the Airman again. Yes, it is a brand uh, I have covered extensively on the channel before, but today I thought, and long overdue, I wanted to um, discuss this particular version. Uh, this is a vintage-inspired limited edition. And before I get into it, I'll do a very quick wristwatch check. I've been wearing the Seiko, my custom modded SKX, uh, it's the 013, my god, my memory is going. My modified version, the Panther Cub there. And I'm gonna discuss this in a, in a video a little bit later on because I have been wearing this an awful lot, especially during lockdown. Back to glycine. Now, I really have to thank Nomon Watches for lending this in. They are an authorized dealer for glycine. Uh, people like Steinhardt, Ball, um, Squale, uh, marathon a lot of favorites of the channel uh, and i have talked about them in the past um, i've personally bought from them they are a trusted reputable watch dealer so it goes without saying you know i can recommend them and a lot of you guys already buy from them now typically with reviews i always go over the history first and again i have to give uh, credit where credit is due um, to an outstanding website called glycentennial.com for providing so much of the detailed information again i'll link that in the description as well uh, it's just an outstanding source of information and history on this very very underrated and important brand <laughs> Glycine is a watch manufacturer founded in 1914 by Eugène Melin and is based in Bienne, Switzerland. It's uh, famed mostly for its Airman line and Glycine has five collections, all of which are aviation or military themed. Glycine initially specialized in designing and manufacturing small movements for ladies' watches, uh, but soon expanded and during the 1930s, they launched their own self-winding watches and subsequently chronometer watches as well. The Airman itself was born following a conversation between a glycine sales manager called Samuel Gleur and Captain Ched Brown, who flew a DC-4 for Thai Airways. So during a business trip to Thailand, Mr. Gleur was able to travel in the cockpit and he was seated at the first officer's uh, place next to Captain Ched Brown and was able to talk to him about watches. Uh, the captain then explained how there was no watch that meets the need of pilots and shared some specifications uh, which he believed pilots from all around the world would really love and appreciate. Samuel Gleur attentively um, took note of the captain's feedback and what the good captain requested was something waterproof and automatic uh, with a calendar, a 24-hour dial, meaning the hand revolves 360 degrees in 24 hours, a minute hand that uh, revolves at the typical uh, speed of 60 minutes but also featuring an external rotatable bezel that is divided into 24-hour units. So Captain Brown said that since more and more pilots were flying on GMT time that this would enable flying personnel to track both local time and GMT of course. Shortly after Samuel Gleur and the good captain returned to Switzerland and they started working together on various prototypes and testing them extensively. This then resulted in the first patent for a rotating bezel and the clamp crown which locks the bezel itself. And as the invention was spawned uh, from an airman, uh, the name was obvious and hence the legend was then born. The airman then debuted in 1953 featuring this unique bezel. Uh, much like the Weems watches of World War II we discussed in my series on the history of pilot watches, but instead of a timing bezel, the innovative lockable rotating bezel uh, could be used to display a second time zone. And with the ever-growing need of um, international intercontinental air travel uh, during the 50s, it was a huge success, especially as you could um, read it very easily at a quick glance. This was much more practical than having a 12-hour watch with 24-hour rotating discs with city names on it. And with its success, Glycine was able to develop the Airman further, adding an extra hour hand uh, not too soon after the Rolex GMT Master, narrowly missing that uh, world first. Hacking was 
added in 1955 to improve synchronization for pilots, along with date magnifiers on the crystal, sometime around 1957, I believe, and even compressor cases by ESPA during the 1960s. In the late 60s into the 70s, the curvy STT variants were released, which were specifically tougher in design, primarily for supersonic transportation, hence the SST abbreviation. These were trendsetters and soon were imitated by competitors, and so glycine pushed ahead. In total, there have been 27 generations of Airman. A quartz Airman in 1979, a world time in 1989, and we have previously reviewed the modern incarnations, which is uh, from around the 2000s, uh, like the underrated Base 22. But let's rewind a bit, because what really secures this watch with its legendary status, aside from the pioneering design, is two things. Firstly, it was greatly favoured by military and commercial pilots. In fact, the Airman was worn by many United States Air Force pilots during the Vietnam War. Glycine then made specialized versions for both the US Navy and for members of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. These are, as you would imagine, extremely desired by collectors. But then another big achievement, and uh, like all great iconic watches of distinction, it actually went to space on the wrist of astronaut Pete Conrad during the NASA Gemini 5 spaceflight in 1965. So an astonishing story uh, behind this piece, and you can start to see why it is um, such a classic. Now, I'll get the dimensions out of the way first. This particular version is 40 millimeters in diameter, quite a slender 11.4 millimeters there. Lug to lug, we're looking at 48 and a half, and then a lug width of 22 millimeters. Undoubtedly a crowd pleaser. Uh, in its scale. So inside we have the glycine GL293 movement, which is essentially an ETA 2893-2, uh, and it operates at 28,800 vibrations an hour. If I pull out the primary crown, you'll see it is hackable, of course. We have the hand winding capabilities, a quick set date, which you see at the three o'clock, 25 joule movement, and with a power reserve of, of about 42 hours. Now, it's important to note that with this movement, the airman follows the more current style of reading the time uh, by driving the main hour hand, that broad arrow, um, around the dial twice a day and then having a secondary GMT um, hand doing the 24-hour duty. This kind of bridges the gap between historical accuracy and contemporary preferences. The handset, as originally intended, are clearly defined in their shapes and differ from one another very effectively, making them highly efficient and easy to read. The loom is a, I would say, a, a lemon green. It's a C1 Superluminova. Despite being rather diminutive, it is with a decent orientation due to the rectangles at 12 and 6, and it's, it's clearly defined shapes for the handset. So you do get uh, very good legibility. And of course, it's on all of the, the hands, with the exception of the GMT. Operating the bezel is very straightforward. You just unscrew. Um, this isn't a screw down crown, by the way. And then you just slide it. Uh, this doesn't have ratcheting, so it's bi-directional and you just slide it uh, to the desired amount. And then you just simply screw it back in. And it achieves this by having little teeth in the clamp there that secure it beautifully. Two other things to note here is the engraved uh, numerals on the bezel are actually lacquer filled, giving it a nice three-dimensional quality. The materials are stainless steel, as you would imagine, and then we have a beautifully domed uh, plexiglass. And then, of course, it comes on this black matte uh, strap. The strap tapers nicely, a genuine lever with just a standard signed little pin buckle there. You'll notice it doesn't have the cross hatch uh, pattern 
that was introduced, I think, in the later uh, Airmans of the 60s. And that was because EPSA, who famously made the compressor cases uh, for divers, actually supplied glycine with many of their cases. Here, it's very faithful to the original, which didn't have the crosshatch pattern. The cream dial itself is somewhere between, I would say, a parchment and an alabaster cream in tone. It's very rich and warm, um, and it does contrast nicely to the black printing, uh, which is very, very clear to read. And because of that plexiglass, you get um, quite alluring distortions when reading it at an angle, but the, the top of the dome is quite flat. It, it raises up quite a steep step, um, but again, this very much gives it that vintage vibe. Um, just so lovable. I really do like that. And, and it's an expansive dial too. Proportionately speaking, the ratio of dial to bezel, we have a lot going on. We've got the minute track towards the center and then two lots of 24 hour markings and there's a great deal of precision if you notice the little syringe style tip to the minute hand reaches nicely there and hits those uh, hash marks perfectly as does the broad arrow hand the date wheel at three is in very crisp white and then the actual date is in a red print again to differentiate uh, from the main dial itself astounding little detail and one of my favorites has to be the uh, what's called the tail end of the broad arrow hand. Now this was done away with, I think in 1957, uh, where they switched to more conventional arrow hands. Now the tail end is crucial because what it does, uh, especially to the original, and it's a clever little bit of design here because it enables the wearer to read the time in 12 hour formats uh, when it's in the PM. A subtle but important characteristic. So for example, you see here, uh, the tip of the broad arrow is, is, is just passing 10, but is also pointing, the back is pointing just past 2200 hours. And talking of the counterbalance, there is none on the seconds hand. Again, another little uh, subtle element that harkens back to the very early days of the glycines. The detail extends to the uh, brushing and finishing of the uh, top of the bezel. If you see it's directional in a kind of concentric circle uh, following the shape of the bezel itself and it slopes nicely downwards into high polish sides and then brushed on the top again directional in the uh, angle of the uh, lugs there. The lugs are quite um, long and hold the strap away from the main case giving the actual strap a nice sense of movement and while we are talking about the strap I have to say it's very supple um, normally I'm not a fan of straps that come with watches, but this I have to say is extremely comfortable. I really do like the quality of it. I think it's a vegetable. Yeah, it's a, there we go. It's a vegetable turn lever there. And it being matte again, kind of in keeping with the understated, more toolish, uh, theme of this watch. On the back, we have a, a, a screw in case back. Very unfussy. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Rolex actually, but then we have a scalloped edge there. Again, concentric circle brushing. I like the fact they haven't done a display case back. Uh, it keeps the thinness. And as you see, it's a limited edition. This is uh, 0180 of a thousand pieces. So let's discuss the positives. Well, first of all, it has a very rich legacy. It's very distinctive in its aesthetic and it has its own identity. Despite being a true tool watch, it is extremely attractive in my opinion and somehow um, treads that fine line of being refined in that classic way, but still uh, very, very not, I'm not gonna say utilitarian. It's, it's a tool, it's toolish, but quite bewitching uh, at the same time. To me, it encapsulates everything uh, about the romance of that age, uh, the sense of adventure from an age where um, aviation was really uh, being pioneered and, and expanding rapidly. Um, and it's an exciting age and you, you do feel that. The fact that it's gone to space, the connection with uh, the US military, you couldn't really ask for more 
uh, historicity and, and lineage in a piece. I've got to give a shout out to my good friend John. Um, some of you may know him from the last War Room update. He is a massive fan of the Glycine. In fact, I think he owns four, uh, three or four. I asked him what he loved about it so much and he's just become completely enamored with them. And I, 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 I totally get it. Um, he said it's because the fun ratio, you get so much fun for the money. And I think it is tremendous value for money. Sure, it's a, a basic ETA in there, but at the end of the day, it's affordable to maintain and performs admirably. Okay, it's not gonna be cask, but I was getting about plus eight seconds with this, which is absolutely fine. The quality as well, we have to address, it's, it's beautifully made, the finishing, um, just absolutely outstanding. Consider, again, considering its price, it punches way above its weight, and I think, uh, my good friend John um, kind of echoed those thoughts as well. It's also relatively thin uh, despite this exaggerated dome. And talking of that, if this is too big for you or you want sapphire, there are a ton of different versions. This is all about being um, strictly paying homage, so to speak, to the very first ones. I love the fact they haven't even got the crown on the a dial. The branding of the Glycine Crown was introduced in 1967. So again, this is very precise and not the triangles that was introduced in the late 50s. Uh, the markers there. Every detail, I couldn't find any QC issues. Uh, just outstanding, absolutely a wonderful uh, um, job in terms of um, its construction. It also feels very, very solid. And on the wrist, it's it's extremely comfortable. I think if you have got the smaller to medium wrist that you can absolutely uh, wear this no problem. And of course, there are the larger, more contemporary options for the larger wristed. And you've got tons of options within a very expansive glycine range. And I think this being limited to only a thousand is certainly going to um, assist it in its collectability and desirability and therefore protect its value. So let's talk about the negatives. Well, unfortunately, this only has 10 meters water resistance, which is just absurdly low. Um, undoubtedly, it's Achilles heel, but don't worry, there are other models that have 100 meters, and I think possibly even more on, on some of the new ones. It's a real shame that they couldn't do something about that um, here. Uh, many will complain at the uh, the crystal not being sapphire. If that's the case, you know, I, I give you the uh, Speedmaster uh, Moonwatch as a good example. Polywatch will be your friend, but you know what? I have to say, I do like the, the fact that they've stuck with the plexiglass. Probably the biggest negative is the connotation with Invicta the elephant in the room, so to speak. Many will see that as a negative, but actually, in my opinion, I think it's a really good thing. Glycine faced possible extinction and Invicta saved it. It continues uh, uninterrupted production from the same factory and the quality has remained exactly the same as well. And the only thing that's changed is the price has diminished. Um, and they can be bought anywhere from $500 to $1,000. This particular one, I think, is about $800. Unfortunately, many online have um, seemed to got it into their heads, and this is a big misconception about glycine, that uh, Invicta have kind of um, inspired some of their later airmans with the oversized, kind of blingy, outlandish design language, and, and that is simply not true. Invicta do not have any involvement in the aesthetics of glycine's watches all they simply do is 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 help fund them keep going um, and some of their marketing strategies for the company which i think is what glycine needs they need to have a little muscle behind them and extra funding so they've never had any involvement in their design for those watch enthusiasts that have falsely accused uh, glycine of or invicta rather of having a negative or bad influence on um, the airman, it's simply not true. I think this watch is a prime example of glycine actually uh, appeasing the core fan base, which is just like back in the day of the original glycine, real pilots and aviation enthusiasts. Um, and if you're into military history, that kind of thing, then having Invicta backing them enables them to put out watches like that. So it really isn't a negative, but I did have to address it. 
So in conclusion, I think this has to be the most underrated, iconic Swiss-made pilot watch of all time. I, I really do um, think and believe that. And it has a kind of cult-like following, which I totally get. And Glycentennial.com is a prime example of that. This watch demonstrates a, a return to um, what made them great. And with this more straightforward design and color scheme, it's undoubtedly going to be uh, very versatile. I know friends who own this watch um, wear it on NATO straps, on various leather straps. It also uh, will work with a variety of attire because that classic stylishness of the era it's from especially lends itself more to uh, even formal uniform. And I can see, especially from my friend John's perspective, coming from a military background, and elegance that this watch definitely has while balancing form and function almost seamlessly. What I adore about it especially is that it's a true creation between a pilot and a brand that was willing to innovate. Um, it's tooltastic with that 1950s beauty. I mean, the little tail of the hand reminds me of a Cadillac, you know, the, the, the wings of a Cadillac, this kind of thing. But at the same time, um, I have to say, it's, I think it's rather beautiful. You know, it's unpretentious, it has its own thing, it's its own distinctive identity, which is so important. And I think that always marks the sign of a great watch. It's also a military classic, uh, a pilot and space going classic. Few can boast this much heritage uh, and achievement um, in a watch, let alone at this price. And also I think encapsulates um, and demonstrates the ingenuity of engineering in the 1950s. Uh, for me, the Airman will forever be a gentry favorite, uh, and it is certifiably and unequivocally pure class, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be very sad sending this back, and just when I thought I didn't want another watch, now I'm considering the 36, <laughs> the 36 millimeter version. Yeah, crazy, but so, so cool. And shout out to John, uh, I totally get it. and. Also, thank you again to Norman uh, Watches uh, for, for lending this in. Um, but yeah, let me know what your thoughts, queries, comments, opinions. And if there are any Glycine Airman fans out there, let me know what you um, what make of it, which is your favorite model. Uh, I love reading the comments and the discussion below, so please don't forget to share that. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.